So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, tonight's Research Tuesday presentation, Pregnancy Protection. I'd first like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite, Theberton and Roseworthy are built. My name is Julie Owens and I'm the Pro Vice-Chancellor Research Strategy at the University. Now tonight is part of uh, what we regard as a central uh, element of our mission as a university and that is our role to share our research with the community to demonstrate how our people are working to address some of the big issues we face, both locally and globally. Now, so far this year through Research Tuesdays, we've explored the origins of animal life on Earth, the discovery of gravitational waves, and we've looked at how our forensic scientists work to solve crimes. We've looked at Aboriginal art and heart health, and tonight we turn our attention to vaccination, and specifically maternal vaccination. Now, our first speaker, Associate Professor Helen Marshall, is an NHMRC Senior Research Fellow in Vaccinology here at the University of Adelaide. She's also Deputy Director of the Robinson Research Institute and Medical Director of the Women and Children's Hospital Vaccinology and Immunology Research Trials Unit. Helen is a member of the Australian Technically Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation and a member of the World Health Organisation Task Force on Maternal Influenza Vaccination. We also have Associate Professor Rosalie Grivel, who's an NHMRC Practitioner Fellow, uh, who has conducted uh, important research into uh, maternal pregnancy, health problems, uh, outcomes for infants, uh, was at University of Adelaide until recently and now has moved to Flinders University, but continues to collaborate with her many colleagues here at the University and the Women's and Children's Hospital. Now, following their presentations tonight, we'll invite questions from the audience, which is very much a part of making our Research Tuesdays work. So we'll have roving microphones and give you every opportunity to ask questions and engage in discussion with our presenters. But first, let's welcome Associate Professor Helen Marshall. Helen. Thanks very much, Julie. I hope you can all hear me adequately there. Um, and just before I get started on my presentation, just from a, a personal perspective, I wanted to acknowledge um, my colleagues in Perth who recently um, put on a, um, a seminar on maternal immunisation and unfortunately it had to be um, closed because it had to be, had to be uh, finished early because um, of disruption from some of the uh, members of the audience. Now, I'm, I know that's not going to happen tonight, but I just wanted to um, be clear that um, we all need to really respect each other's opinions around immunisation. I know it can be a controversial topic, um, and certainly if we can leave questions till the um, end of the presentation, as Julie's indicated. So, just a bit more about my background. Um, Julie mentioned uh, my, I guess, my academic role uh, in the University of Adelaide and the Women's and Children's Hospital. Um, I'm a clinician, so I'm, I'm a medical practitioner, and I'm a researcher in vaccines and infectious diseases. Now, we have a, quite an extensive research program, and um, that program, um, I guess, is developed into three different streams, and the first one is um, I'm an investigator on clinical trials, uh, which are really there to assess the safety and effectiveness of new vaccines. Now, we don't develop those vaccines. Vaccines are developed by the vaccine manufacturers who develop the vaccines that are included in the immunisation program, but we do the clinical trials in adults and children. The second stream is really understanding how health-related conditions, um, such as um, immune deficiency or pregnancy, obesity, even disadvantage, um, the health problems that um, occur with disadvantage can actually impact on vaccine effectiveness and what we can do to um, address those problems and improve the effectiveness of vaccines. And then um, our third area uh, is really about how we can improve uptake of new vaccines by understanding um, barriers, facilitators, and even community preferences for immunisation programs. And really tonight we're going to focus on the second and third streams. 
So, um, as uh, Julia mentioned, I'm an NHMRC Fellow and Deputy Director of the Robinson Research Institute and Medical Practitioner at the Women's and Children's Hospital, and I also have a role, honorary role within SAMRI. But my most important role is as a mum with three children who are all up to date with their immunisations. So the presentation tonight is um, really going to look at um, pregnancy and I'm very pleased that Rosalie's agreed to come and talk a little bit about the immunological changes that occur during pregnancy that might actually um, put women at risk of serious infections. Um, we're then going to talk about why we vaccinate pregnant women um, and specifically for influenza and whooping cough immunisation which are recommended for pregnant women. Really important to understand the effectiveness and safety of vaccines that we're delivering for pregnant women. And, and then we're going to um, finish up with understanding how we might improve uptake um, for vaccines in pregnancy. And um, hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end just to talk about some of the new research initiatives in vaccines for pregnant women. So I'd now like to hand over to Rosalie, who's going to talk to you about um, pregnancy and the many changes that occur. Thanks, Helen. Um, it's um, great to have the opportunity to be part of um, this presentation and um, talk to you about some of the pregnancy um, side of things when it comes to immunisation. And um, certainly, I think every woman in the audience who has been pregnant, or in, indeed anyone who has ever known a pregnant woman, will agree that pregnancy is a very unique time in a woman's life and that there are many changes that happen to her body during the pregnancy and soon afterwards. And in fact, pregnancy is a very interesting physiological state because to continue and for it to be successful, so for the baby to continue until term, it requires some degree of tolerance of the mother towards what is essentially in any other sense a foreign body, the fetus, the baby and the placenta. And it made me think when I was um, preparing these slides that perhaps, and some of the mothers in the audience may um, relate to this, perhaps being a mother is all about being tolerant very much from the get-go. And indeed, in some of the literature, the analogy is used of organ transplantation. So the fetus um, is in fact not of the same genetic makeup as the mother. Half comes from an unrelated individual. And the mother's body must carry that um, person um, that is not directly related to it throughout the pregnancy. And as I mentioned before, pregnancy is indeed a very significant time of change. Every system in the woman's body, in fact, is modified from very early on. So from six weeks of pregnancy, there are changes that happen which are allowing the mother's body to cope with the pregnancy and allowing the pregnancy to continue and be successful. Um, and in fact, the blood flow, the function of the heart, the lungs, the muscle, and indeed the immune and inflammatory systems to which this talk is directly related all change very substantially. And sometimes that change is different at different stages of pregnancy. And as you would expect, most of these changes are not ultimately harmful to the mother or to the baby, but there are definitely pros and cons. And there are times in a pregnancy where a woman's body is at particularly increased susceptibility to various conditions, infections being one of them. And um, like most of the changes, it's all about a balance at different stages of the pregnancy for what's best for the mother and the baby. And as I mentioned before, the main bodily systems that are um, of interest when we're talking about infection are the immunological and the inflammatory systems. And we have a rather sort of primitive idea that there is a system change whereby the body turns towards a pro-inflammatory state where it's very aggressively producing um, markers that are causing inflammation. And then there's the opposite, which is we call anti-inflammatory. And indeed we think in um, early and late pregnancy and mid-pregnancy, there are different profiles that occur. And this probably aligns with the time of pregnancy where we think women are at particularly increased risk in the mid part of the pregnancy where their immune system is really dampened down and they are at substantial risk of infection. And the interesting and concerning thing about this time of pregnancy is that if a woman gets very unwell, her baby is still very early. And if the baby needs to be born or is um, delivered spontaneously, that baby can be at very substantial risk due to prematurity. So as I mentioned before, um, pregnancy is a time where a woman is 
far more vulnerable to a range of attacks from infections in particular, and both viral and bacterial types of infections can make women themselves very unwell compared to how they would normally respond in a non-pregnant state. And in addition, we must consider the fetus. So the baby can suffer specific side effects from a severe maternal disease, and in particular, a very severe sepsis or infection. And things like a very high fever for the mother um, and low oxygenation when she has her lungs affected by an infection can make a baby very unwell and cause damage to that developing baby. And even simple things like a very high heart rate in the mother, a natural response to an infection can make a baby unwell. And in some certain situations, the baby can get specifically infected. So both maternal and fetal protection are very important, as well as the protection of the newborn through the um, mother's ability to pass antibodies through the placenta, essentially. So in addition to the risks that I've outlined that place pregnant women at um, substantial vulnerability to infection, pregnancy is indeed a time where women who are otherwise well, and even when having an entirely normal pregnancy, tend to present to some kind of medical or healthcare system for care related to their pregnancy. And that makes it a very ideal time to optimise their health, and we do that in a number of ways. But in particular, maternal vaccination is a nice example of this. And then we are then able to not only improve her health, but to improve the health of the pregnancy that she's currently carrying and the health of her children um, down the track. So I'd like to hand back to Helen now. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very much, Rosalie. So why do we suggest we need to um, immunise pregnant women? Well, the reason, as Rosalie's outlined, um, and, and I'll be providing further evidence for, is that pregnant women and their infants are at increased risk of severe disease from common infections. How many people here in the audience have had influenza in their lifetime? So a common infection. And pertussis is, is a common infection too, but we are perhaps less aware of that, whooping cough or pertussis in adults, but certainly is a really um, serious infection in infants. So um, for influenza, as many of you have experienced but, um, f and would know, it's usually a febrile illness with cough and rhinorrhea. Um, can develop, um, you can develop systemic symptoms such as muscle aches and pains. Um, but the problem with influenza is then you're prone to um, bacterial complications such as pneumonia, which can occasionally be fatal in pregnant women and children. Whooping cough or pertussis, also known as the 100-day cough because it's a prolonged cough um, in infants, children and adults, um, can be severe and life-threatening uh, in very young infants. Uh, and it's very much characterised by that hoop sound. So it's called whooping cough because um, a um, the problem is um, for the infant, they develop this thick, tenacious um, mucus that sits in their airways and they have to cough with extreme pressure to cough that out. And they cough for so long that they take a large <gasps> breath in like that and, and that's the hoop sound that's made. And, and because they're coughing so much, they can often um, get a lack of um, oxygen to the brain and, uh, and uh, rarely um, can get brain damage. So, a very serious infection in young infants. So <clears throat> influenza infection in pregnancy, um, the data that really supports um, pregnancy as a risk um, for, uh, pregnancy as a, as a state that with increased risk of severe disease comes mostly from studies that were done during the um, swine flu pandemic, the H1N1 09 influenza pandemic. And this is data I'm just showing you here from the Australian and New Zealand intensive care um, influenza investigators uh, who published uh, this paper looking at just three months of um, influenza uh, during that pandemic at the height of it. And 64 pregnant women or post or after delivery uh, were admitted to intensive care with con in confirmed influenza. 39% of them um, delivered preterm, and unfortunately, three of those resulted in infant deaths due to um, the premature delivery. Seven women died, and um, there were four stillbirths. So it was really um, at that time of the swine flu um, epidemic that it became um, obvious that pregnant women were a really high-risk group for severe outcomes from influenza. 
So much so that a pregnant woman compared to a non-pregnant woman with influenza had seven times the risk of requiring intensive care admission and if they were over 20 weeks gestation, um, 13 times the risk. And we, we just know with influenza in pregnancy that as the pregnancy progresses, um, the risk goes up um, for severe disease. So what about influenza in infants? Now, people don't really think too much about influenza um, being a problem in children. We know that children really are the super spreaders and spread it to um, the infection to adults. Um, but if we look at this um, data here in this figure, you can see that the highest, and this is looking at hospitalisation uh, rates, um, sorry, notification and hospitalisation rates, you'll see that in that under five year age group, um, they have the highest rate of both um, notification and hospitalisation. And then if you look at the little graph inserted, you'll see that it's really the under ones that have the highest notification hospitalisation rate um, of all age groups. And um, in addition to that, influenza vaccines are only licensed for infants from six months of age. So prior to six months of age, we don't have an influenza vaccine to protect this particular age group. So you can see for um, infants under six months, uh, they are vulnerable to influenza infection. So what about pregnant women, um, whooping cough? Um, we, we really have very little data available about pertussis infection in pregnant women. But what we do know um, from a number of studies that look at transmission of infection to infants is that in over 50% of cases of um, pertussis in, or whooping cough in infants, the parents are actually the source of transmission of infection and it often is the mother. So um, an, another good reason to try and avoid transmission um, to provide immunisation to the mother. So um, in infants, as I mentioned, um, pertussis is extremely serious in young babies. And we had 12 um, babies that died in the last epidemic here in Australia. Um, and the WHO estimates uh, 2,700 and four infants under one month of age died from pertussis in 2015. So we have this vulnerable age group um, where they're under three months of age. They um, need two doses really to provide adequate protection for themselves, that active immunisation. So they're really at this at risk period for the first few months of their lives um, with premature babies also being at increased risk of severe disease. And this is from work that we've been doing um, in our research. And again, just to show you that, if you look at, um, this is a number of hospitalised cases, if you look at, say, 16 out, is that showing up there, to um, 16 weeks of age, um, to 18 weeks of age, where we start to see a decrease um, in pertussis hospitalised cases um, due to um, pertussis immunisation, it's really the majority of cases are in this group here before they receive their own immunisations that end up as in, in hospital with severe disease. So immunisation during pregnancy offers a mechanism to protect not only um, the pregnant woman but also their newborn baby and that's by providing direct protection so if we um, give mum the immunisation against pertussis or influenza they develop their own antibodies to provide direct protection for themselves, but they also um, provide indirect protection to the infant, um, really by the um, amazing ability of the placenta to transfer the mother's antibodies to the fetus, um, particularly from, the 20, from 28 weeks of pregnancy. And it does such a great job that um, we often find that the infant actually has higher concentrations of the antibodies than the mother um, by um, transfer of antibodies through the placenta. And this really provides this passive immunity, what we call passive immunity, where the mother's antibodies are protecting the infant before they develop their own active immunisation to immunisations they receive in the childhood program. So just to really summarise that, um, that the evidence that pregnant women are at increased risk of severe disease complications and death from influenza, um, and this is really compounded by that potential for um, adverse pregnancy, fetal and newborn outcomes, as we mentioned, um, as I mentioned from the ICU data during the pandemic. Um, newborns and young infants still remain at risk of severe infection, particularly um, prior to receiving their own um, primary immunisation course. Um, we see for infants, the maternal immunisation improves the transfer and amount of protective antibodies um, to the infant. And not only that, um, 
both that mechanism of direct and indirect protection. Also, we reduce the chance of transmission of infection from parents who, who may develop influenza or pertussis. Um, we're preventing that transmission to the infant as well as um, providing antibody protection. And not only that, the World Health Organization has identified pregnant women as the highest priority group for funded in influenza vaccine programs globally. So recommendations for maternal immunisation. Um, I'd like to tell you this is new information, but actually we've been immunising pregnant women for a long time and it's really not, not a new um, idea. So um, back in the 80s, uh, the World Health Organisation um, put forward the Maternal Neonatal uh, Tetanus Elimination Initiative to provide protection for mothers and infants from tetanus um, in areas where um, births were occurring really un in unhygienic environments. And that has, has um, been implemented um, over the last couple of decades and resulted in a 94% reduction in deaths from tetanus in newborns. Influenza immunisation in pregnancy, again, it's not really new. It's been around for about 50 years and been recommended, but we haven't had a funded program until um, 2010 in Australia. And we know when vaccines are not funded, um, they, uh, there certainly is less uptake of vaccines uh, in the community. Um, and pertussis uh, or whooping cough immunisation was recommended for pregnant women and introduced and funded in the United Kingdom back in 2012 and in Australia since last year. So the recommendations are for influenza vaccine to be re recommended at any trimester of pregnancy, and this is through a nationally funded um, program as childhood immunisations are. And then the whooping cough vaccination um, is given as diphtheria tetanus pertussis vaccine and is recommended in the third trimester. The idea would be really to um, make sure that uh, we're getting the highest possible transfer of antibodies to the newborn infant in that vulnerable period. This is um, funded by the states and this really came about because of um, a number of deaths of infants um, a, a couple of years ago during the pandemic, uh, sorry, during the um, pertussis epidemic that the states um, really saw the need to um, have these programs available for pregnant women and is recommended for every pregnancy. So um, for influenza um, the vaccination, the um, risk to the mother of complications really increases uh, in the later stages of pregnancy, as I mentioned. The later the pregnancy um, goes on, the higher risk of severe disease. Um, influenza vaccination provides that um, protection for infants against influenza in that first six months of life, particularly when we don't have vaccines available in that age group. Uh, and we know that um, influ influenza immunisation in pregnancy is safe and effective. And I'm going to show you data to support that statement. Um, and that it, it is recommended that all pregnant women should be immunised as early as possible in pregnancy so that they have protection early on. So um, pertussis uh, vaccine is recommended as a single dose during the third trimester of each um, pregnancy. The vaccine has been um, shown to be more effective um, in reducing the risk of pertussis in young infants than vaccinating the mother um, prior to or after pregnancy. So you may or may not be aware, but before we were immunising pregnant women, we were actually using a strategy called cocooning strategy where you um, provide pertussis vaccination to everyone that comes likely to come in contact with that infant. So grandparents, um, mum and, and dad, of course, and, and make sure that siblings in the household were up to date. Um, but that strategy, studies have actually compared that strategy to immunising um, in pregnancy and shown that really um, pre vaccinating pregnant women um, is more effective than the cocooning strategy. The antibody uh, levels tend to peak about two weeks after vaccination and we have that ac active transport, as I mentioned, across the placenta to the fetus from 30 weeks um, gestation onwards uh, with the optimal time, as I mentioned, really being in that early in the third trimester um, to make sure we are um, vaccinating prior uh, enough time for those antibodies to develop and move across to the infant, um, but also to make sure um, if a baby's born a little bit premature that we, um, the protection is there as well. 
So I've talked about influenza and pertussis and they are the recommended uh, vaccines. Um, but there are vaccines obviously that are not recommended during pregnancy and I just wanted to mention that. So these are particularly vaccines which contain live viruses such as measles, mumps, rubella, varicella. And these are not recommended in pregnancy because of the possible risk of transmission of the vaccine virus to the unborn baby. This is a theoretical risk. Um, Unfortunately, on occasion, you know, pregnant women don't know that they're pregnant and they get vaccinated with a, a live virus vaccine um, and there certainly has been no adverse effects of, noted uh, f from those outcomes, but um, it's certainly something that we um, suggest is not given. Um, and the way, I guess, around this is really um, in planning pregnancy to uh, make sure that women who are planning pregnancy have their immunity checked so that um, there may be an opportunity to have, um, if, if they have low antibody levels or haven't had a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine previously, that they have an opportunity to have that done prior to becoming pregnant, or at least um, if not, then they should have that after delivery. So I just wanted to um, show a video around um, this whole idea of um, pregnancy acceptance of um, vaccine, vaccination during pregnancy. And I guess the risk um, that um, if, if a woman decides not to get pregnant, there's certain, uh, sorry, not to um, have vaccines in pregnancy, there is a risk associated with that. And now this video um, was sent to me um, by one of the ac academics, and, but apparently it's gone viral, so you may have seen it before, but I thought it was worth, um, I think it's really important to understand from a, a parent's perspective um, around um, immunisation in pregnancy. So I'll just... My name is Kami and this is Eva and unfortunately we've been in hospital for the last three weeks. Um, yeah, Eva was diagnosed with um, whooping cough, pertussis and yeah, it's been a nightmare. <laughs> I've been a um, very healthy pregnant woman, no problems, no complications, um, worked worked out, went to the gym every day, ate very healthy, had no deficiencies had a natural birth and somehow through the process of the last two weeks of my pregnancy I've managed to get whooping cough. I don't know why and how and I managed to get it. I didn't know. Um, I've given birth. I was coughing a bit. I went to check myself just because I thought, oh, I'm coughing for a few days. It's a bit annoying. Um, especially when, you know, when, when you're coughing and your tummy is a bit sore from giving birth, it kind of feels a bit uncomfortable. I quickly found out that I have um, pertussis and well I've given it to her um, yeah the first few days were like oh, okay a bit of cough what's everyone is on about she's just a bit coffee a bit nasally we'll get through it within two weeks the cough became pretty scary horror movie coughing to the point of going blue flopping in my hands can't breathe running into hospital she's then better sent her home the day later back into hospital again a night later she's got another apnea where she's not breathing for three minutes and it just ended up in upstairs here in the hospital in um, uh, what do you call intensive care with just a baby that coughs and coughs and coughs and it's just so hard to watch your little tiny little thing and they go red and from red they go blue and sometimes they go a bit black and for a moment they think they're dead in your hands they flop um, a lot of suffering for a little tiny little cute thing that you love so much I was offered the injection in wing 28 and being the healthy, fit, organic woman that I am, I said, leave me alone, I don't need, I don't need this crap. <laughs> and even me, the bulletproof lady that's never been to a doctor, traveled the world and felt healthy, got, got the whooping cough. I got over it very quick. It was nothing for me. But she is into week four and yeah, every hour I've got to stay here. Watch her going blue, give her oxygen, watch her cry, watch her having a hard time eating. She's my only child and my first. And if I could turn back time, I would have um, protect myself. So that's my message. So very distressing for a parent to have an infant develop whooping cough. It, it's, um, it's the severity of that illness. Um, we, and we certainly still see, escape out of here, certainly see, um, thank you, we certainly see many cases of um, 
whooping cough um, at the Women's and Children's Hospital in these very young, um, vulnerable infants. Now, okay, so really important. How safe and effective are um, influenza and pertussis vaccines during pregnancy? So um, maternal influenza vaccine effectiveness, now there's a number of studies have been done uh, looking at the effectiveness with a whole range of different um, designs and um, because of that they, we end up with um, different vaccine effectiveness but around about 61% um, of um, sorry, the vaccine is, influenza vaccine is about 61%, 60 to 70% effective in pregnant women. Um, and you might think, well, you know, it could be better. Well, sure, could be better. It's fairly similar to what we see in um, non-pregnant adults as well. Um, the influenza vaccines are about 60, 50 to 70% effective. And that comes down to really depend on the circulating strain. Um, and they just tend to be less effective than other immunisations that are a part of the immunisation program. But what's interesting is um, a recent randomised controlled trial of influenza vaccination in Africa uh, showed that um, for infants, about 86% of infants are protected at eight weeks of age, and then which reduces down to about 30% by six months of age. So it looks like um, they get high antibody titers in that um, early vulnerable period, uh, and which and we know we know we see um, antibody titers tail off um, with influenza vaccine, but it provides that protection through to six months. And again, um, just a couple of studies here looking at um, uh, the effectiveness really around hospitalisation. And again, we see a variety of, of results here depending on sometimes on the study design, um, but um, good um, protection early on. So um, this is some work, and I just I've put photos of um, some of the students on um, these. Um, studies I'm going to show you because they're the ones that do all the work. Um, we certainly work very much as a team, but um, it's all their efforts that are going into um, generating this evidence. So this is a systematic review of um, safety of influenza vaccine in pregnancy. And, um, and Mark looked at well, seven, over 7,000 papers um, with 27 um, identified as uh, important papers looking at um, the difference in um, outcomes, in infant outcomes, in both vac in the vaccinated and unvaccinated groups um, for influenza and found for no significant difference um, in congenital abnormalities, uh, fetal death um, or spontaneous abortion. Really important information just to be reassuring um, to women that um, being vaccinated does not put you or um, your pregnancy at increased risk. And I've really just included the um, studies here because I know for um, congenital abnormalities is certainly something that people would be concerned about with vaccination and um, these odds ratios here really around being around one show um, no increase in congenital abnormalities in the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated group. Another study that we're doing uh, called the flu mum study which is funded by NHMRC and led by Professor Ross Andrews, this handsome gentleman here. Um, and Kate is managing um, that um, in our group, that study. Um, it's an observational national study to assess the effectiveness of influenza, um, maternal influenza vaccine in preventing influenza in infants under six months of age. And around Australia, we've recruited over 10,000 mothers and their infants, and we're linking the vaccine um, history of those mums to influenza notifications in infants, so we can determine how effective influenza is in the Australian context. And as part of that, um, Lisa McHugh, who's from Queensland and part of the team, um, has looked at um, the infant safety outcomes from this cohort of 10,000 um, mothers and their infants. And compared, um, she's actually looked at the groups that received influenza and pertussis vaccination um, concomitantly or the same time and found there's really no difference in um, the uh, gestation at delivery. And uh, she's looked at birth weight outcomes, so looked at birth weight of infants where mums received uh, influenza vaccine. 
separately to uh, whooping cough vaccine and then looked at both influenza and pertussis vaccination given at the same time. And, and as you see, there's really no, certainly no significant difference and hardly any difference at all um, when you look at 19 grams and, and 7 grams. So again, no difference um, in safety outcomes for the infant um, with uh, birth weight. So what about um, pertussis vaccine, uh, which, as I mentioned, recommended in the third trimester? Um, the the um, UK introduced whooping cough or pertussis vaccine, as I mentioned, in 2012, and um, they've done a lot of work on um, assessing the vaccine effectiveness in their you know, huge population, millions of doses provided to pregnant women um, with an uptake of 64%, which is actually a very good uptake for the um, first country to introduce a whooping cough program. And they've estimated the vaccine effectiveness in infants under three months of age is 91, so that's fabulous. 91 is very high vaccine effectiveness. Um, by vaccinating pregnant women, we're reducing all that um, risk and disease in young infants. And um, in addition to that, they've been monitoring infant deaths, obviously, once they introduce the pertussis, pertussis, uh, maternal pertussis immunisation program. And they've had no infant deaths from uh, mothers who were vaccinated, no infant deaths from pertussis in mothers who were vaccinated um, and received the vaccine at least 14 days prior to delivery. They have had some um, deaths, um, but these have been in unvaccinated women, women who did not receive pertussis vaccine. So they've also looked very carefully at the safety of pertussis vaccine in pregnant women and um, looked at 20,000 um, vaccinated pregnant women. Um, and look, using historical data, they've looked at um, in, whether there's any increased risk in stillbirth and found no increased risk of stillbirth, um, no increased risk of uh, preterm delivery, no increased risk of, still, of maternal or neonatal death, preeclampsia or eclampsia. So a whole lot of um, pregnancy-related um, problems, um, certainly no um, difference in the pertussis um, vaccinated group to unvaccinated group. And again, um, this is um, members of my team who are looking at a um, systematic review and of safety of pertussis vaccine during pregnancy. And for those who might not understand, a systematic review is really where you look at all the, um, the published literature and sometimes the unpublished literature as well around um, your topic and, um, and Mark and um, Michelle and Adriana have, have done that. And again, so this is for pertussis vaccination during pregnancy. Again, when we look at these odds ratios, which is uh, um, potential for um, uh, increased or decreased risk, we can certainly see there's no increased risk um, for pre premature birth. Um, if anything, decreased risk, but not significant. So none of these are significant. And as you can see, looking at um, uh, these um, plot the plots here that um, there's certainly no indication that there is any safety concerns around pertussis vaccination for premature birth, stillbirth, um, small for gestational age, so a baby that delivers um, small in size under the 10th percentile, and uh, again, congenital um, malformation, no indication, and low birth weight, no indication of any concerns around the safety of pertussis vaccination during pregnancy. So just to summarise all that, um, vaccine, vaccination during pregnancy for influenza and pertussis is safe and effective. Um, we, vaccination, we've got shown evidence that vac influenza vaccination can prevent infection in pregnant women and their infants, um, that these vaccines are safe in pregnancy. And these demonstrated benefits with the good evidence on safety in vaccines really underpin the Australian and the World Health Organisation recommendations for antenatal immunisation. But having said that, we still need to continue surveillance and monitoring and safety and effectiveness of immunisation. It's really essential. Um, we have good data available, but we need to keep um, be really looking at this to make sure that we are, um, that our immunisation programs are safe. And there are um, a number of ways we do that in Australia. So these vaccines are now freely available um, in Australia and recommended in every pregnancy. And as I indicated, really, that's because we get this um, fairly rapid decline in maternal antibodies after um, the first year of vaccination. So how can we improve uptake of immunisation during pregnancy? And that sort of assumes that it's, it needs improvement, and I will show you that it does. Um, 
So this is again um, data that's been generated from our flu mum study nationally looking at the uptake of influenza and pertussis vaccination around the country which sits at about 45-46%. Um, now I think we're doing pretty well in Adelaide here with 56 and 57. It's certainly we're um, way above the, um, the average here um, as, as our Perth. Uh, but I, I still think we have a long way to go um, to reach, uh, to, to be able to provide um, adequate protection to all pregnant women. So thinking about this and just thinking about um, what our uptake should be for pregnant women, if we think back to the childhood immunisation um, schedule and uptake of childhood immunisations in Australia as a starting point, um, from work we've done here um, with John Lynch and with Helen Bedford and Anna Pearce from um, the University um, School of London, um, we looked at this question um, and um, from the data that we generated, um, which is uh, published, looked at the proportion of the population that agree with immunisation uh, and found that only 1.3% actually don't have their children immunised because of anti-immunisation views or being non-immunisers, um, which really means that 98.7% of the population agree with immunisation. But there are, because our uptake sits at around 92% for childhood immunisations, about 6 or 7% are um, unimmunised or under-immunised. And what we found in this analysis that we did, uh, which is a data linkage um, study, we found that um, being a, a sole parent, um, being from a large family, having low social contact and service information, um, we're associated with um, parents not getting their children fully immunised, uh, fully immunised, and um, and also just having health concerns uh, raised anxiety enough that um, sometimes put parents off having their children immunised. So if that as a starting point. We thought, well, perhaps with um, uh, immunisation in, in pregnancy, we actually should be asking pregnant women about their views on immunisation. And some of that work we've done in the flu mum study, but we've also done a study that's been published looking at um, pregnant women's views. Uh, it's a qualitative study um, that Joe Collins led, and um, it's an in-depth in interviews of 17 pregnant women. And what we found is that most pregnant women were not actually aware of immunisation re recommendations. So that's, you know, um, something that we need to do a lot better. We need to find ways of uh, making sure that pregnant women are aware. Um, but, but the other finding was um, that they very much rely on their healthcare provider for um, information about immunisation. And if their healthcare provider um, endorsed immunisation, then um, they would absolutely agree to it. So it was very important to them to understand the risk and benefits, so it was really important that that was explained to them and they could make um, a decision for themselves around the risk and benefits. Uh, and previous vaccination experience also, if they previously had influenza vaccination, they felt more comfortable with influenza vaccination during pregnancy. So although the role of the healthcare provider was really identified as vitally important, the majority of um, women told us that they hadn't um, been advised about the recommended vaccines from their healthcare provider. So more on the sort of quantitative side, so this was um, data from the 10,000 women in the flu mum study. Um, we, our findings were really um, that actually if they'd had um, pertussis vaccine in pregnancy, they were more likely to have received influenza vaccine. And this is certainly something we've seen in our own hospital, um, at, the, at the Women's and Children's Hospital, providing pertussis immunisation um, Pregnant women seem to understand and want to protect their newborn um, baby from whooping cough. But influenza, they um, uh, feel that it's more protection for themselves than their baby. And so pertussis becomes really the priority immunisation, but it tends to drive um, influenza vaccination as well. And we see increased uptake in that group. If an obstetrician recommended, a GP recommended, midwife recommended, um, they were more likely to be immunised with influenza vaccine. Um, I guess one of the findings that we need to pay attention to is that, um, strong attention to, is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, women and their um, were less likely to have received influenza vaccine and I think that's somewhere where we need to do, certainly need to do more work. So we spoke to pregnant women and then we thought, well, the pregnant women are telling us that 
um, the healthcare providers um, are very important in decisions around um, vaccines in pregnancy. So we talked to the healthcare providers and we talked to obstetricians, midwives and GPs um, involved in shared care. And they actually told us that um, there were bar bar barriers to accessing immunisations. They were very supportive of um, recommendations for um, any immunisation program, particularly for pregnant women. Um, but they saw that there were barriers in that um, the GP was providing the flu vaccination, but if the um, woman was attending the antenatal clinic and then had to go to the GP, they might not actually have a GP. That just might not happen. And these, this, there were these structural barriers that were um, reducing uptake of um, vaccine during pregnancy. Uh, and this was prior to, um, prior to the vac pertussis vaccine being free. You know, they've got to take it to a pharmacist, fill it in, which costs them 70 bucks, but it, now it's free. Um, so again, there, are, there were certainly barriers um, to um, pregnant women being able to access um, influenza and pertussis vaccine. And the other interesting finding was um, really about the whole idea of immunisation of pregnant women really being part, becoming part of maternal health care, so being part of the whole health care of a pregnant woman. Um, if it's, if it's like, if, if it's, um, it needs to be part of what we do so we don't forget it. It's the whole idea of standard care that gets picked up along the way. And if it doesn't become part of policy or a clinical guideline, you open up to being missed. And you know, it would be common sense that if it's severely going to affect morbidity and mortality, it would be part of standard care because our hospital would be liable in that situation. So the healthcare providers were saying, yes, we agree. Um, we want to support uh, immunisation in pregnant women, but we need the structures in place to be able to do that. So another suggestion from a midwife was, you know, why isn't there a tick box in the pregnancy handheld record? There needs to be a tick box so that we automatically include um, maternal immunisation when um, women appear in antenatal clinics for their appointments. And one of our other findings that I think is really important to mention, um, particularly around vulnerable groups too, is um, that we identified in the, in the research that we're doing that non-English speaking and multiparous women were more likely to, uh, were, sorry, were less likely to have received pertussis vaccination. So something that we really need to address um, and um, we are in the process of doing that. So out of this research, um, we now have perinatal guidelines on immunisation that have been developed as part of standard care. Um, it, pregnancy, um, the pregnancy handheld record includes immunisations. Um, we are looking at other ways to really monitor the uptake of immunisation and look for other um, barriers. And, and we've also developed brochures um, in the three most commonest uh, non-English languages of women presenting to the Women's and Children's Hospital, which are here. So um, Vietnamese, Arabic and Dari. So just in summary, um, I think improving vaccine uptake is about education of pregnant women and immunisation providers. It's um, showing the evidence and, and understanding the evidence that uh, influenza and pertussis immunisation is safe during pregnancy and effective. Un really understanding this dual benefit that we're getting protection for um, the pregnant woman to protect her of, against infection during pregnancy, but also um, that transfer of protection to um, her newborn. And some people really um, see pertussis immunisation for pregnant, uh, pregnant women as really the first dose of protection for the infant. Influenza, the idea that influenza vaccination provides protection for the infant as well as the pregnant woman, um, it, I think is a really important message to um, get across as well. And encourage healthcare providers to recommend immunisation during pregnancy as women very much trust their healthcare provider to give them the best advice. Um, and, and from um, data from um, one of our studies, three quarters of the unvaccinated women say they would have been vaccinated had their provider recommended it to them. Um, and again, this whole question of better access to immunisation for pregnant women, what can we do to make it easier for, um, reduce the barriers and make it easier, uh, making it part of standard care for pregnant women, both in the public system and the private system, um, and ensuring, absolutely ensuring equity of access for women of all cultures and diversity. And I'm pleased to say we've made some progress here. Um, you'll see, so this is data from uh, 2015 here, this orange line, um, influenza 
vaccine and pertussis vaccine and you'll see that um, we're really up around 80% uptake for both. This was um, at the end of last year, July to September last year. So I just wanted to um, really, I guess, emphasise the importance that of um, continuing research around maternal immunisation. We've got some good data that shows it's safe and effective, but we really need to continue surveillance to make sure um, that continuing um, safety profile and develop any, um, and, and identify any problems if there are any. There are um, potential um, vaccines being developed, other potential vaccines being developed for pregnant women. So group B streptococcal infection, which is um, a very severe infection. Uh, it's uncommon, but um, it's about as common as meningococcal disease, invasive meningococcal disease, and has very severe, uh, it's a very severe neonatal out, um, infection that can have um, nasty outcomes for infants. Um, Respiratory syncytial virus. Has anyone heard of respiratory syncytial virus in the audience? Oh, there's a few hands. That's good. Um, I need help in, in another, another name for it because respiratory syncytial virus is, a, is quite a, um, a, a long explanation for a virus that actually causes the commonest respiratory infection in infants. And I think um, when we're trying to talk to, um, to anyone about these sorts of infections, we need to think about a better way to um, educate and explain around some of the infections that actually cause um, and, and can cause devastating inf uh, disease in infants. And th this particular virus is bad for uh, infants who are premature and have uh, chronic lung disease. Um, they can get severely unwell and um, in a life-threatening situation. So um, an RSV, maternal RSV vaccine is um, being developed and studies are, are being conducted in Australia. And of course, Zika virus, um, not perhaps um, locally so important at this stage, but of immense global um, importance and significance um, with, as the cause of microcephaly. And um, vaccines are in early development around uh, protection of, against Zika virus. So um, another study, and this is a study that Mark's um, leading in my group, called I'm Safe, and it's really um, to uh, provide a very um, rigorous way of looking at safety of um, maternal immunisation, particularly focused on pertussis. And um, we're collaborating uh, with Claire Roberts, who is leading, and Gus Decker, leading the STOP study, which is enrolling 1,500 pregnant women in their first pregnancy and an ex extensive collection of pregnancy and infant-related um, health information. And what we want to do is have the opportunity to do um, a prospective cohort study going forward to really provide the highest level, and, level of evidence internationally on the safety of antenatal um, pertussis vaccination. And we have that um, in as an application to Channel 7 Children's Foundation. So if there's anyone from there, that's a very important study. We hope to get funded. Um, Optimum um, is uh, looking at um, the effects of um, obesity in pregnancy. Um, there is good reason to think that obesity may impact on vaccine responses. And we want to get a better understanding of that and whether um, there is any um, reduction in um, protection if you are obese versus non-obese, particularly in pregnancy, where obesity is also um, a risk factor for severe disease. Um, and the other study is um, called MIMS, um, and it's looking at, um, it's a randomised controlled trial to really see whether verbal and written information to women of non-speaking backgrounds um, can improve uptake or is it something else we need to be looking at, such as other you know, cultural issues around um, vaccination during pregnancy? We have a pilot study that's shown um, lower uptake of vaccines in pregnancy um, with women who have English as a second language. So I really just want to finish up by saying um, immunisation is not just about protecting the individual. Um, many vaccines work by, um, not only in, in pregnancy, by protecting two individuals, but um, every time you or I receive a vaccine, we are actually protecting everybody that we come into contact with. It's much more, it's much less about me and it's much more about we, um, that immunisation is a way of protecting um, the community as well as the individual. But I'd just like to give the last word to the children. So, <laughs> and I have lost, 
I just want to, I just have an acknowledgement slide really. Uh, somewhere here. So just to acknowledge um, all the funding bodies in NHMRC, um, SA Health in providing funding, uh, Women's and Children's Hospital Foundation, Robertson Research Institute, Channel 7, um, ARC Industry, and all our collaborators, I only mentioned some of them here, um, particularly families involved in research and very much um, my team, Virtue at the Women's and Children's Hospital.